means that you decide to obtain high paying jobs and then donate to money. Even with no guarantee that you may donate, do not join the retreats in Africa because you decide that your personal obligations and the privileges that you want are absolute morality. So you can kick as much as you want to establish your basic needs, but everything beyond that point is a form of privilege. This means you can pay for your own cancer treatment and such and such, but if we have to choose between going to Harvard University and donating for meals for the entire continent of Africa, we would rather pick in, we would rather individuals pick the latter. We think that opposition ultimately has to defend a world where they don't have the kind of donations they want, where you lose out on significance of amount of money because individuals constantly subscribe to new obligations that prevent them from ever getting some kind of like social justice. Three points for you today. First thing, how effective altruism is a cop out of people's responsibility and obligation to others. The opposition needs to address and defend a case in which they are willing to lose enormous amounts of donations and time for individuals in order to perceive their own ideas. First thing, we're going to tell you that it's an incredibly malleable standard. So self-interest, this is on a principle argument, self-interest is done in opposition to morality. Morality is a complete disregard of the birth lottery. It is an understanding that no matter how much I have, other individuals have less. That I am born in privilege and I am not disregarded by society at large. Privilege is the understanding that you don't necessarily need to have like a bucket, a bucket of money to be privileged, but just by being able to afford the basic needs that other underprivileged individuals don't have, you are privileged in of itself. What does this mean? The malleable standard of a high paying job falls prey to self-interest along the way. Three levels of anybody's life. So work is a success. Is you constantly telescope what your goals are, the moment by which you go down the path to work. This means that if even if I get my job, it's not sufficient to have that 40k a month because at the point which I have 40k, it is now based, it's now based on a framework of success. A framework that any success means that the past, it has to just be better than the past successes. It plays into the human greed that you always want more no matter how much you have. You always compare yourself into other individuals. So your goals therefore become I will donate and how much you actually donate. Second level, you are unconditioned to sacrifice. It normalizes the idea that it's okay to save. You do not need to give no matter the stereotype. It plays into the capitalization that you don't need to be able to sacrifice that this is something that's your life and you're okay with it. It never pops in beyond the back of your mind. Third level, you subscribe to other forms of commitment. You can buy house loans. You can, buy, you can get car loans. Things that ultimately take up the rest of your income and make you prevent, like, prevent you from ever donating because you constantly take up more obligations. The richer you get, the more obligations you have to give, like a family. But what is the impact of this? We say that the huge amount of diminishing returns never get to the most vulnerable. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. There is a different value of utility for a dollar for an individual who is underprivileged as compared to an individual who is privileged. There is no, no benefit in having that dollar if you are underprivileged. But according to, but if you were just like a child or someone in a domestic, sh domestic abuse shelter, that money is something else. It is a tampon, it is a condom. That is something that can go to the lives of other individuals. Second point, you lose out on the mountains of effective aid. So the majority of individuals under their side who are in the moment of calculus on whether to provide for charity or provide for themselves are likely very young. You likely have a sort of dispensable income and a desire to do good. But this narrative tells you that you should work to do it. This is the reason that you lose out on a lot of passionate work. Three reasons why. Number one, as a to other countries in the world, you know that you have time if you fail or if you're not financially secure, you have more time in your life to recuperate for that retirement fund. Second level, you create a lifelong attachment if you enter it when you are young. So being like altruistic is a commitment that you can trade. It is something that you go into and the more you go into, it's almost like a drug and an addict. We say it's far harder for individuals to opt into that on their side. But the third thing is the diminishing returns that you have are even less as a young person as compared to someone in need. So because you are young and able-bodied and strong, your commitment, you owe an obligation to individuals who no longer have that. We say this is the same thing with old people. So the increasing amount of wealth that you have in old age, because you have that wealth and you want to do good, that narrative tells you that you shouldn't do that good. Third point, 
how does altruism look like in our world? It's not specifically our burden to tell you that this world is going to be something that eradicates all forms of atrocities, but we say that you have to reimagine this world as not just the status quo, but a complete plus plus of that. So three layers as to why. First of all, there is a huge ease of donation. So you don't wait. You don't wait for you to get the next paycheck or secure your wealth. Instead, you secure your basic needs and you're more willing to give other people your basic needs. Second thing, you are willing to employ yourself in spheres of charity. So because you don't mind giving up your time or working for a higher job, you accept the job as making working as an environmental lawyer or as a doctor in a government hospital instead of a specialist. This means that the aid that you give, you can still upskill to becoming a specialist, but giving like lower pay in government hospitals means you give more aid at a more affordable rate. Third thing, morality means a complete redistribution of the world's wealth. Notice the fact that there is so much wealth in the world that if you disperse it equally among everyone, everyone would be an above average level of wealth. This is meaning that individuals who are billionaires in their world automatically disperse their wealth in order to understand that there is a basic need to be accomplished, that there is more individuals in the world who are culpable and have a struggling livelihood. Ladies and gentlemen, ultimately today, what you have to believe is that if government can attain all of this material wealth for individuals who have nothing, who are poor, who have diseases and illnesses beyond recompensation, if that is preventable, why would opposition prevent that? Thank you. All right, thank the Prime Minister for this speech. We invite the leader of opposition to come. Hello, can I be heard properly? Yeah. All right, setting up timer. Okay. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Honorable Chair, two things coming from my speech today. Number one, the principal justification as to why we think that effective altruism is an inherent good. Number two, a comparative on which side is more sustainable, a world where we think that we regret effective altruism or in a world where it's incredibly prevalent. But firstly, what does effective altruism actually look like, right? We think, Honorable Chair, it is a world wherein people are going to be like incredibly reasonable. They're going to be able to give to you with analysis while thinking about their own personal self. They're going to be thinking about long-term maintenance to help social welfare. And they're going to be able to take high-paying jobs to be able to not only help themselves and help their family, but also be able to prevent things like donor burnouts, so that you're able to help a majority or at least like a, so one, in, one small group of people, but for an incredibly long amount of time. One in extraneous response towards opening government. Because we think that the biggest fault of opening government was to assume that literally everybody is capable of being able to be absolutely consistent, that everybody can just give literally, donate all of their money or a lot of their money at a flash. We would like to suggest to you that, look, not everybody is incredibly rich, right? We think that, sure, you can donate. A lot of people can donate. But we have to understand that a lot of blue-collared workers and a lot of people living minimum wage jobs can have the susceptibility to fall into things like poverty, to fall into losing their jobs and to like emotional havoc. First, first argument on why we think that we're principally just why we take the moral high ground in this debate. We would like to suggest to you that effective altruism is certain. You have to understand that, look, problems are dynamic and solutions can never be static. Because you have to understand that when your issues are incredibly big, in, if, you're, if you're trying to solve problems like mass poverty or poverty of this one person or poverty or, or issues like the climate, you have to be able to go to long-term solutions to be able to deal with this. You have to understand that help needs to be, and aid needs to be consistent. Because when you have, because on, only, when, only when you have consistent, like at least short bursts of, of aid, you were able to you were able to solve problems that are such a, are at, that are such at a large scale. We would like to suggest to you that look, helping poverty and climate and like being being able to help poverty and the climate requires you to be able to continuously help them. It requires you to be able to, for instance, if you're helping a family, it requires you to be able to help a kid go through things like preschool and up to college, right? Because if you're only able to go into help that kid go from preschool to grade five, we think it's incredibly 
half-baked, right? We think you don't get the full benefits. But more than that, we would like to suggest to you that effective altruism is the most efficient because look, sure, on regular altruism, you are able to, you are able to help these people. But the biggest problem is you, like, you are probably going to put yourself second, right? We would like to suggest to you that only when you have self only when you have effective altruism in place, you were able to help yourself first and be able to preserve yourself for the future. But more than that, we would like to suggest to you that only on our side are you able to have help that actually materializes, right? Because of the fact that, look, since your help is constant and consistent, you are able to ensure that this kid is able to get the scholarship. When he does get things like the scholarship and financial aid from you and, and, and like their food and like, assistance in general, you were able to get things like, that you're able to assure that this kid gets things like a job, right? We see that then, only in effective altruism are you better likely to have help that is intergenerational, that goes down from the kid that you help down to, the, down to his parents, down to his younger siblings. We tell you that in, like, in, uh, in, we tell you then that given, given this, like only are we able to, like we're able to like have a broader spa spectrum of people we're gonna help. But more than that, we think that when you're able to have more altruism on our side, because people people on the ground, people that do can engage in altruism, altruism can say that a it isn't incredibly difficult. It's easy to opt into because I'm not going to get donor burnout. But number two, it's a, it's it's better because I don't get deprived of my emotional and my money. And number three, the 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 effects are more long term, and the spectrum of people you're able to help is wider. We think you're able. We think that we're able to help this. We're able to win this debate because look, we're going to prove to you why we are able to consistently reach people on the ground and help them in the long term. Because you have to understand that look, people up in the people. A, why we have to we have to posit to you why it's sustainable in sustainable in our side. Because you have to understand that, look, for people to be able to be altruistic in a long extension of time, they need to be able to cater to their needs as well. Because altruistic people aren't necessarily like the incredibly rich people of the world. You have higher than your side, you're likely to be incredibly and and we think that you like all of your benefits up to in the short term. We think what what the, the likelihood is the only people that are able to the the the, the only the only people that are gonna be able to help are those people who are incredibly rich who can throw tons of money in ahead. Right? We think this is, this is ineffective because sure you are able to help these people like eat for one day, but the long term structural problems that need to be solved aren't solved because they aren't solved overnight because their money because their money is exacerbated in a matter of days, right? We think that this is a waste of money and resources because the because the effective altruism philosophy suggests that look, you're able you you help people because they are deprived of their resources. We think it's counterintuitive therefore for you to be able to put people in a situation where there's a propensity for them to go back. We think that long term solution is better off on our side because of the fact that look, scholarships exist and like you're able to feed them for the long term. It's only possible when there's a long stream of help. Lastly, on like and a comparative to regular altruism, you have to understand that look, on their side, sure you're able to donate all the food that, that, that they're gonna be able to that, 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 that they're gonna be able to help themselves today eat. But you have to question are they able to help improve their lives in the future? You have to understand when you have a, a notion of regular altruism and there's a standard for you to become relatively rich already. The only people that can donate on their side is the people who are already rich, right? Those people that like, own tons of restaurants and those people that have a lot of resources. You harm yourself and your family on their side because you are pushed to the notion that you need to exacerbate yourself. We think it's harmful on their side because, look, if, the, if, if, if like, as I said already a while ago, you have, you need, we need, for us to be able to solve structural problems, you need to be able to donate as much as possible because you have traction. But more than that, it's easy for these people to bite into because of the fact that, look, it's much more efficient in, in the sense that you're not, not going to deprive your own money. You're still going to be able to help your own family. But second level, you're able to paint the people in the middle and help them, help, help them opt in. But also, you're able to paint the picture that, look, in the long term, the, pro the, problem, the problem is overall solved, right? So we think it's easier for people to bite into a notion like that, right? But lastly, you prevent people from being incredibly scared because on their side, you scare people from depriving themselves of their own money. We're very proud to oppose things. All right, we thank the leader of opposition for the speech to continue the debate on opening up. Deputy Prime Minister. 
Hi. Am I audible? Yes. Panel, make no mistake, effective altruism is a facade of moral convenience that you're able to like momentarily not discharge your moral obligation towards those who are vulnerable, towards those who are starving, towards those who don't have a home, and towards those who literally are going to lose their basic right to life. Because maybe if you donate it now, you won't solve the problem in their long term. It's the exact kind of language an opposition house is running on. Precisely because they say you can save individuals in the long term with a small amount of donation, you are never going to donate to a starving African American child. You're never going to donate to Africans who currently are facing structural problems, and you never are going to realize that your MS, like when you amass wealth, that in and of itself is immoral in this debate. We would propose an opening government a radical year, that this debate is a motion of regretting effective altruism. We say that effective altruism has been the primary way in which capitalists and selfish individuals have tried to facade their lack of need to fulfill their moral obligation towards individuals in a world in which we reimagine re the world where effective altruism doesn't exist. We say individuals, the moment we set the clear standard of you having your basic necessities fulfilled, you end up donating every single amount in access towards a global fund that ends up redistributing it fair towards all individuals is a prop it's a it's a mechanism that effectively solves all structural problems as a whole there's like upwards of 300 trillion total wealth in the society as of right now we say that's sufficient for every single individual to attain every single basic right in this world that is the extension coming from opening government first question is debate then is effective altruism an inherent good two things i want to clarify here right a it is immoral in and of itself to wait until you get a long-term solution and even that what is something that they cannot guarantee on their side of the house every year you wait millions of Africans will starve all the harms of the underprivileged face are ones which they are directly suffering from right no they don't like they're literally going to have to lose their lives at the point which you don't have food at the point where you don't have a shelter to shield them from the elements of cold they cannot shield themselves from winter all these harms can literally be solved at the point you choose to donate to creating some form of even momentary shelter for these individuals to provide a net level of good towards individuals as a whole on the other side of the house we told you two specific nuances as to why you're never going to end up donating the first is that the idea of effective altruism in and of itself plays into the self-interest of individuals and we think self-interest is in direct opposition to morality because morality is a fundamental acknowledgement that the birth lottery is unjust at the moment in which you recognize that you could have been an individual that's starving on the street you would probably ask a rich individual donate to this individual to ensure that he has his basic rights fulfilled not specifically that the entire principle is literally crippled at the point which effective altruism exists because your now your goal now on that opposition isn't to create a world in which you create some amount of change is to ensure that you're actually able to solve long-term problems and that is the standard before you even start acting on the other side of the house even if you agree to the extent that the standard is one that they can achieve their world is one to have a like their world is one which they don't ever lower the standard because the moment which we give individuals some form of basic sustenance right now the standards of what it takes for them to gain long-term sustenance is also one that's lowered at the point which a shelter literally prevents them from having to starve on the street or having to lie down in the cold winter night. We propose that in a world in which all individuals in society opt to policy, you end up creating a world where you can able to solve those problems from their side. But secondly, how does this directly place the capitalistic world of society of today's society, oh, the moment I can fulfill my obligations to my family, then therefore I will donate. These still are shackled by the fact that they don't end up solving structural problems because their donation is going to be small amounts. We propose that in this current world, in the vast majority of instances, the standard of proper sort, like proper solvency on their side, is likely to be one of Bill Gates, where only when you are as rich as Bill Gates, your Melinda Gates Foundation, for example, can end up solving malaria, and that's the only world which you're actually going to end up, like, end up sacrificing some amount of wealth or sacrificing some amount of effort. But more specifically, in the process to attain wealth in and of itself, you are shackled by capitalist constraints, which means the moment you get a single, a single promotion, you would realize that you could maybe have attained more. And the moment you attain more, you can maybe therefore have more to donate to other individuals and there will always cause a meal never ever end up donating when they think we think they have the burden to prove to us why they are, why is it they are good at, why is it they are going to end up donating in any instance of their side. Before we move on closing. Um the whole point of effective altruism or taking a higher paying job is so that you have more capacity. 
because we literally told you how this isn't an if like okay let's be clear here effective altruism is a moral in and of itself for ourselves to justify things of proper immoral like justify justify our immoral, immoral actions for example when you do have sufficient amounts of funds to sustain your own basic needs you tell yourself that i should still amass my amount of funds to maybe get a promotion or get a bigger house because i am able to therefore do better and have like maybe a more productive working self and gain more money and after that i'll end up donating more towards individuals but if you look at the real world how many individuals actually donate under this current system is one that's highly unlikely to occur because of all the reasons we gave you it is malleable it plays into your own interests it plays into the capitalistic world it plays into human greed in and of itself the moment in which you're able to access more you want more those are structural responses which you gave to you opposition has to engage with that second form of immorality we tell that the mere amassing of wealth in and of itself is immoral when businesses amass wealth they profit by taking money from innocent individuals that could have better use for their money when you charge for example food with a 60 percent profit margin that is money in which individuals could probably use for other and better purposes. The state, on a state level, you would literally amass wealth with unjust trade, literally crippled uh, like developing nations. And as a business, you literally take wealth from your workers and instrumentalize them as a whole. This is why H&M and Nike literally have sweatshops that oppress individuals and deny them basic rights to basic sustenance. We propose that all these actions are justified to an extent when H&M and Nike can go, oh, I did it so I could amass more wealth, so I could launch a better PR campaign, so I can do only towards more plausible causes that I can effectively solve. In the long term, all these problems are ones which JF to deal with and the immorality of its actions are ones in which we regret on our side as a whole. On to the extension, we will propose that as of the world of opening government, where effective altruism doesn't exist at all and the only standard of morality is the one that's pure and true to itself, we will propose that you won't have any structural problems at all in the counter-narrative we provide. Why? Because the moment in which no individual amasses wealth, the moment Bill Gates is and still top people solve material plus worth of total wealth in status quo. The redistribution of that, the moment in which each individual has a sufficient mo like has sufficient fulfillment of their basic needs, is one in which all people around the world can access basic sustenance and access basic needs such as this the old by capitalism was not corrupted by human greed very proud all right we thank you for the speech to continue this debate. hello can i be heard yep you can okay i will just get my comment thank you There, to reiterate, according to the info side, active altruism is based on the evidence reasoning and um the impartial impartial and reasonable ways into where we're able to become more altruistic. That's why I do not understand why government keeps pushing that billionaires will want to continue being billionaires and people would want to be more exploitative if and that is how it makes um, effective altruism, altruism ineffective. Because if it's already proven and it's already evidence that you don't need to be a Bill Gates for you to be altruistic, but effective altruism, as long as that I'm able to continue being able to give money to the poor, and that happens when I have a stable job and provide my basic needs, and I have at the very least a little or more extra, then that already passes on to opposition. What am I going to tell you in my speech? The first is to tackle the question, are we actually going to damn the urgent needs of the people in Africa or the, the, the people who are starving and in poverty and the multitudes of people who are facing discrimination? And the second is, 
where are we able to actually generate altruism and where are we more likely to be moral, right? Rebuttals will be integrated by arguments. So first, are we able to actually damn the urgent issues in society? I would like to posit no. Realize that in status quo, and I believe that this debate um, exists right now, is that you have to assume that people are born into different levels of wealth and different levels of capability. The government assumes that everyone in the world is not a billionaire and is poor and is in the process going on, of uplifting themselves before being able to help, right? In the world of opposition, where effective altruism is dependent on you being able to uplift yourself at the point in time that you're not sure as to whether you being altruistic is healthy, both for you and both for the people that you're going to help, then naturally, this only occurs to the individuals in the middle and the lower class. The billionaires, it's logically an evidence base that's provided with government that already um, should be able to have money, would naturally should be, um, be able to give and be able to shell their money to the people in Africa and to the people in poverty. So we negate the thing coming from opposition. The second thing that they tried to say was that it is bad because you are helping yourself but you're not able to help these people and you doom yourself because you are. that's where you're able to pull yourself into being capitalist and being self-centered. The first thing is that this is just unreasonable because if that were true, then that means there is up to no point into which you're able to give and that's already against effective altruism, which basically says that if it's evidence and logically you be you should be able to um, donate at this point of your wealth, then you should be. Like for example, if the living standard in Manila or in the United States is 1,000 US dollars, then if I'm able to earn 1,500 US dollars a year, then precisely I don't have to be a Bill Gates, I can technically still donate. The second thing that engagement is, they assume that finally you are able to help these people urgently on the ground, but if that means to say that I get landlocked into poverty and I get landlocked into being hungry because instead of investing into my education first or instead into getting my master's to ensure that I'm able to keep my job in a very competitive market, then even if you're able to help these people on the ground, it comes at the cost on you. So it becomes a zero-sum narrative. But the reason as to why it's actually worse and not a zero-sum narrative is because provided by Johan, when it has to be cut short and it's half big, it's not as effective. Realize structural problems such as you being able to be raised in an orphanage or you having education for you to have a job is long-term. And if you cut it short, it becomes ineffective. I'm only able to reach grade five. I won't be able to have a job. If I'm only able to be properly raised in an orphanage until 10, then I'm going to be vulnerable for the last eight years of my childhood, right? <coughs> so the conclusion to this argument is simple. The first is, under the under the guise of effective altruism, it is not true that billionaires get to keep amassing their wealth because mm -hmm. that is already unreasonable and that was already explained by the Korean government. The second that is that it doesn't have to be for you to keep being a billionaire and therefore be you um up into the more unethical morals of being a billionaire, so long as you're able to sustain yourself um consistently. So if you get a stable job and not one that is like day um day to day basis or nine to five, then you're already good under effective altruism. Where are you more likely to generate altruism and where are you more likely to be moral at the end of the day? So let's tackle the moral one. I won't take any POI. So realize that in GovBench, for you to be absolutely moral and you for you you have to swallow the pill of you having to give no matter what, right? Why is this bad? First, birth lottery. Look, some people are born privileged. Some people are not born privileged and some people are born in the middle. Let's tackle the first one. So the, um, the people that are super privileged are people who can afford technically being altruistic and not want to be in the long term precisely because even if I am not able to have a high paying job or I'm not able to make good investment to have good returns, I have a big trust fund that I can rely on, right? So already, it's already an easy way out for them to clean themselves more moral. The people in the middle and the people in the lower ground, though, are doomed to be done because they're like, why do you have to think about yourself? Why did you think of your fellow people that are also suffering as you? Class is terrible. Realize that the people who want to go to Harvard because they want to be, they want to get the highest amount of education possible because they have to be competitive. They can't afford to not get a job. 
Because the moment you, they don't have the response or safety net info, so in the world we're in, they're actually dooming people into that type of situation is immoral based on their own circumstances that they did not choose upon. At least in active altruism, wherein you're able to uplift yourself too, we are actually giving people, um, giving people the equal chance to be moral. Billionaires already because they have reasonably a lot of money will have to give. People in the middle and the people in the poor area are able to uplift themselves first and are able to sustain themselves and at the same time still claim to be moral because at the point of time that they're able to up, um, they're able to have a uh, have a sustainable job, then that means to say that they're able to give to everyone. The impact of this is that first we are able to be more moral to everyone and fair. But second, we are able to get more people to opt to, which is not only just good for altruism, but it's good if we're talking about structural problems that we need to have as much money and as much people actually cooperating. For that, we are proud to oppose. Thanks. All right, we thank the activity of all for that speech. To start the closing of the debate in both of Hi. Can everyone hear me? Okay, give me one sec. Okay. okay, starting in three, two, one. Right, ladies and gentlemen, today we have some pretty strange ideas of what effective altruism actually involves and what the world would be like if we don't practice practice effective altruism, right? So before I go into any rebuttals of let me remind you of what we were told in the info slide. How claim, what causes to give to, and how to contribute to causes based on the idea of the utility of your actions. Secondly, it's the idea that in order, in, in line with this kind of thinking, you should aim to maximize your income by taking high paying jobs in order to be able to donate the maximum amount of money, right? We are not saying that we should, um, people have to give the same amount no matter what or anything like that. We're simply saying that it's, we don't think it's moral or effective for you to simply calculate based on benefit to other people, um, based on this objective idea of utility, right? We are not saying that you have to give no matter what and people living on the streets have to give the same amount of bill as Bill Gates. We are saying that we believe that people should be able to donate to whatever causes they want in the manner they want, whether it be monetary or not, whether it be by making the most money and donating it or by helping on the streets and volunteering in soup kitchens, right? That is what we stand for today. The ability to choose what kind of causes you donate to and the effectiveness and the ability to maximize your effectiveness to the world. So, in my extension today, right? We see side opening, uh, opening basically only talked about how it legitimizes self interest and talked about this as a simple justification on the aims of charity acts and how we believe effective altruism isn't actually charity anymore. And also giving you effective mechanization on the actual effects of effective altruism, how it doesn't actually enact long term change and how it diverts attention away from other equally important causes that may be important to people personally. So, Firstly, on the idea of principle, right? We think that different people have, can have different preferences about the issues that they support, and we don't think that they are any less legitimate. If I really, really care about red pandas in China, I should be able to donate however much I want because I personally believe it's a really big issue. You shouldn't be shaming me because I donate a similar but lesser amount to another issue that you think is more important. For example, um, a different kind of animal in China, right? We don't think that you should be judging me because I decide to um, donate to whatever causes I want because it's my money and I think it's my decision, right? Moreover, we think that this kind of effective um, altruism goes against the principles of charity. Why? Because we think the idea of charity is motivated by compassion for other people and their dignity. We think that giving to other people, deciding to give the benefits you've received, is a recognition of the fact that every person is an individual worthy of dignity and respect. What happens when we tell people, oh, your cause, I'm not donating to you because I don't think your cause is as effective. I don't think, no, thank you. I don't think helping you is as effective, right? We think that this sends a very bad message, both principally and practically, because it creates a lot of resentment among the people whose issues aren't chosen, whose issues aren't highlighted as a hot topic of the day that you should be contributing to, right? We think that people deserve better and they shouldn't be labeled as lost cause and left behind, right? So moving on to my next one. Why? We think that using quote unquote evidence and reasoning to determine what causes to help and how actually has real, real life consequences and is not able to effectively help people, right? My rebuttals to um, what opposition said will be mainly be integrated into this point. So side opposition told us about how 
aid has to be consistent and how effective altruism ensures aid is consistent. We tell you that they never gave us any specific elaboration on linkage as to why effective altruism is more consistent. We say that to us, it's even more likely that this aid will be stop, stop and start and even more inconsistent because it's based on what people think the most pressing issue of the day is, right? We think that this would be even more inconsistent compared to in our paradigm where people donate based on the issues that they personally care about. We think that when people donate to things that they care about and things that they personally believe in, it's more likely that they'll be invested in the issue and keep the aid going for a longer period of time. Therefore, we don't think that their point actually stands. Right, next, how much to donate, right? We think that laymen don't have the expertise to actually know that, to actually consider what kind of issues to donate to, and they're also not that invested and, and not that willing to do research. What happens is most people will, will rely on authorities or NGOs to help them decide what issues are the most utilitarian, and that means that most people, the majority, will donate to the same few causes. This takes funding away and centralizes attention on certain causes, and we think this is very harmful. Why? Firstly, because we think that it diverts attention away from other, and secondly, we think that this creates a perverse cycle when people will think that they've done their duty by donating to those hot issue topics while completely disregarding other issues that also need attention and help. We think that this is extremely toxic and creates a kind of complacency without people actually caring about the multifaceted issues and the layers of different issues in society. Right, moving on, we also think that this kind of um, effective altruism devalues smaller community-based Actions, which is unconducive to actual benefits to society and change in the long run. Why? Because we think under effective oh, yeah. altruism, yes. Why should like my donation to the Twitch streamer I like the most that plays my favorite game be more important than the donation I can give to the people in Yemen that are suffering? Right, I don't think that it's our place to judge how people spend their money. And I think that you can donate to a Twitch streamer and you can donate to people in Yemen and people shouldn't judge you for it. If under your calculation, every sip of water I drink is wasted because I should be spending the money I, I use to buy water, to buy toys on people in Yemen, we think that it's completely crazy to say that every single cent you spend on your own entertainment or your, or on your own happiness is morally wrong. We don't think that we should be having that kind of calculation or that kind of decision. Right, moving on, back to my point, right? We think that under effective utilitarianism, like you said, every hour, for example, if you're a high performing lawyer, every hour you spend handing out soup or teaching people in the community center is an hour wasted because you could have built it for thousands of dollars to more expensive clients and then donated it to charity. This completely disregards the personal satisfaction and the personal reasons why you engage in charity actions. And we think that as people from engaging in actual charity actions, right? we have, I think that actual change is done when people go out and do things, right? For example, like I said, community-based actions, like running a soup kitchen, like teaching migrant children, right? We think that we can't simply solve problems by earning the maximum amount of money and then throwing it at whatever problem is a hot issue of the day. We think that it's important to recognize that there are smaller actions that you can take and that it isn't morally wrong for you to spend time on yourself or on time, time on issues that you think are important or significant that give you personal satisfaction. Therefore, we think that their kind of idea is very twisted and wrong, right? Lastly, on the idea of earning to give and why that's very wrong. We think that, like our opening said, it's wrong for people to legitimize their actions, but moreover, we think that it's important to recognize that the elite currently earn their money saying that they'll give back, but it's important to recognize that the profit that they make is based off the, the way that they've exploited people in developed countries already, right? They earn their money from disadvantaging other people and then they give it back to the very people whose suffering they profit over. This is very morally incorrect and puts entirely the wrong focus on the issue. And so because we're the only team to actually give you mechanization and concrete impact, because side opposition is going to completely go on the idea of what effective altruism actually is, extremely proud to propose. Thank you. All right, we thank member of the for the speech. We have member of OP to continue the debate. Thank you. Give me a second, yeah.
The biggest problem when it comes to altruism in today's society is that people forget about doing for others, yet it's always about things like personal satisfaction. If it's true that I can choose to donate a hundred or thousand ringgit to my child's school to build another air conditioner or send a bunch of kids to a, a different country to represent, my, uh, to represent my home country, for example, in international competition, if I can choose to donate to the Notre Dame church which is burning, when literally there's millions of starving people out there who are I much more pressing need. I think there's a serious problem in society today. The mere fact that we do charity only to be able to tell ourselves that I've done something and only to be able to comfort ourselves yet not look into the efficacy of how we help the rest of society is the only is one of the largest reasons why society hasn't progressed when it comes to helping the most vulnerable. Throwing a big bash once a year and inviting orphan children, orphan ch orphan children to the largest hotel in KL isn't going to help them structurally or improve their way of life. Rather, on the side of closing opposition, we tell you that we have, must hold individuals to higher standard, that we must hold individuals accountable to the charities that they do and tell them that everything they do isn't just for themselves. Rather, it has to be for the greater good of society and constantly hold them accountable to the types of charity they do. I think a lot of OG's material, things like them telling you that on, their, on our world, people will be selfish and prioritize themselves is completely irrelevant to this debate. Because literally what effective altruism mean is that you can do as you should do as much as you can in your capacity to do for do more for others so things like amassing wealth for yourself buying a bigger house buying a bigger car all these things don't make sense simply because we hold individuals okay. to a higher standard in fact these are things which happen on their world when ceos of, of companies can just give five thousand ringgit to csr and tell themselves they've done enough when they literally earn five million a year I think we hold individuals to a higher a, 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 to higher standards. The second thing they say is that you always try to find structural solutions, hence you forget about doing these small things. I think it's just so much better to do um, to find structural solutions because feeding an orphan child once a, one time in a year isn't going to feed them for the rest of the year. I think, for example, if you meet an orphan child on the street, sending them to a government agency is a structural solution that probably can help them. So I think that we still get far more good on our world. I think on their world, individuals are content with whatever small things they do and don't think about the larger implications, which is why charity oftentimes fails, and which is why a lot of ineffective charities continue to thrive. In, in places like Malaysia, we have charities which literally get mil, uh, thousands of ringgit, and there's so much of corruption within it because they're able to tell they're able to have like posters showing like sad children and society falls for it just because by giving to these charities, they apparently feel good without like checking the monthly re budget report to, to check and see if these charities are actually effective. I think these are the major failures when it comes to charities and these are things we fix. So moving on to CG, they say, the people should be able to give no matter where they give because it's about the personal satisfaction. If it's true that a lot of times the rich are complicit for the, a lot of crimes that the poor face, I'm unsure as to why we should prioritize the personal satisfaction of the rich given a lot of times they as they themselves say, they exploit the poor all the time. Why is it? Why must we prioritize the personal satisfaction of a CEO to give to where he likes if it's true that he exploits people within companies? I think a lot of times the, the reason why we should value charity and the reason why effective altruism is good is because it serves as a reminder to individuals that their obligation is to do for others and not just care about their personal satisfaction or how they feel. I think it shifts the burden to individuals and reminds them about all the atrocities that they've done and why they're personally complicit complicit to all the harms, hence have to find the most effective solutions. Lastly, will this discourage people from um, doing charity? I think that A, even if this discourages people, I think we have more we have more genuine people doing charity, so it's we're okay to trade off the few individuals who are uh, in genuine to begin with because that's just a bad way to brand charity and just the, the trend analysis of people doing like ineffective charities or doing like very... Uh, um, a charity which seems like a facade is just a bad trend analysis to the way charity is conducted. But secondly, I think that if we are able to constantly remind individuals of the horrors that people go through, and a lot of people still face that guilt, they're able, they, they are forced to face the um the uh the truth that they have to do more and they are held to more accountable standards. We can still hold individuals accountable by, by using things like guilt and telling them how much they owe society. And I think a lot of individuals who do charity is just that we 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 are convenient when we do charity. I I think if you remove that convenience to things like media and just 
telling individuals how uh, why they must do effective altruism is still a benefit. First extension, why we get a, a far better uh, a better brand of charity on our world. I think on their world, if it's a if it's a comparative between working in a hospital um and like a charity hospital or working in like a private hospital and like earning two million to like give back to society, that's it not not that's it not good with like earning that money because they're just able to save a lot more lives. I think this is better because the priority cannot be about the individual, but should always be about the amount of lives that saves that that's saved because these are individuals who are victims to begin with. The birth lottery means that there's a lot more people suffering and if you the, the brand of charity that we're able to constantly prioritize the rich is one that's bad. Secondly, why do we get more wealth distribution? In society today, we hold individuals um, to a very low standard. The standard is literally on the floor. A, a, a large company can do so little, yet get so much of PR and so much of like um, brand recognition because altruism just, there isn't a high standard altruism and how effective this is. I think now individuals are forced to make structural changes and solutions. Individuals are when Bill Gates like has a solution which is just so ineffective for children, but branded as philanthropy, he's questioned and held accountable as to how this actually helps those individuals. I think this means individuals are held to a higher standard when it comes to doing, and they just have to create more structural solutions because they're entirely questioned about the efficacy of their charity. We can no longer hide behind the veil of like altruism because it has to be effective and it has to trickle down to the most vulnerable. But lastly, I think an hour. A lot of charities can't just hide behind because the reason why we get a lot of like poverty continuing is in a lot of charities are extremely corrupt and we don't check on them. We merely just give to charities and then forget about it because we just want to tell ourselves and feel better. I think this removes the notion of feeling better, but rather it's about continuously checking about the efficacy of your charity because it isn't just about doing good, but making sure it trickles down to the most vulnerable. I think we hold charities more accountable, donations become cleaner, we, we hold individuals to a higher standard. And this just, can I just clarify, it isn't about individuals having to have one million ringgit to donate. Even if you have a hundred ringgit, that's the most you can do. And that's what effective charity, I mean, effective altruism me, uh, means proud to oppose. All right, we thank member for the speech. Go for to sum up the gossip. Hi, am I audible? Yep, perfectly audible. Give me a sec. And by the way, um, I would prefer POS coming in the chat. Thanks. Look, I'm an aspiring young professional who wants to practice effective altruism. If I actually earn money to the extent where I can buy a house and then I buy a very big house, do you actually reject my decision? Support my decision that my determination and my calculation of effective altruism justifies my purchase of a house because, for example, this exuberant display of wealth would lead to like more wealth in the future because people trust in me and therefore invest in my company. Is that exactly justified? I don't think conventionally we can accept that, right? Because obviously you're preserving a self-interest. You don't you don't necessarily guarantee this revenue stream going back to the social causes they actually want to perform. This is only legitimizing your own self-interest, right? But more importantly, if you reject this decision, that means you also fundamentally create a university after people started of what quantifies as good social causes, what quantifies as utilitarian calculus, then you think people want to achieve. The thing is, how do you ensure that each individual has the same utilitarian calculus, right? Who is the person that is going to determine the definition of the, of the metric for which like each social cause should be judged upon? We don't think that exists. We don't think that all explains the grounding for why the metric could exist in the first place if it, if it does. So we think they're already fundamentally out of this debate. So let's go on to some clarifications, right? We think three clarifications are needed. And 
this. Firstly, we think when Peter Singer first like promoted and advocated for this like theory of effective altruism, we think he's actually perpetuating the wrong norm of charity, right? We think when you, for example, only push the conventional norm of how charity is just giving back to society in terms of donating all your money, you basically also cheapen and undervalue, as Kelly explained, and you fundamentally undermine the other methods of doing good that you can also practice, but now you're going to get like shunned by society because they think, oh, this is not the prevalent method, therefore you're not like pr effectively performing altruism, right? We don't think this is a good method to actually endorse. Secondly, we think that the practicalities of when you self-actualize and how you would actually perform the good and how you're actually going to like perform effective altruism were ignored by all the other three houses, right? We think Kali and CJ was the only person who was able to explain to you why effective, effective altruism as a concept is also not likely to take place, especially when individuals back out once they've achieved that level of like social and economic competence and they're probably not willing to part away part ways with, right? But more importantly, third, we think the opposition bench can't be at the omniscience and wisdom of these individuals contained in this motion, right? Especially like how they can like pick different causes is why their like determination and why their evidence is like superior, right? Because we never see why these exactly up. Right, could you pause the time? Right. Um, can you hear me? Uh, you broke up this now. Fred, what was the last time? Noted. Sorry. Um, is it are you am I audible now? Uh then... Hi, um, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, you're better. Yeah, you're audible. Right, sorry. Um, where did I leave off? Fred. <laughs> sorry? Uh, no, I'm asking Fred. Fred, okay. what was this last time? Uh, it was 2.15. Okay. Right. Okay, sure. Sorry, um, I'll begin there. Right. What I said was, we think all bench can't fiat the omniscience and wisdom of these individuals. We don't think we can allow these individuals to simply like pinpoint exactly what causes. The individuals are superior or have the wisdom to like select better causes compared to like other individuals, right? I think that precisely shows how they have no place in this debate. But let's go on to morality. We think OG gave us an okay framework of how to win this debate, but we think OG never properly explained why their definition of morality should reign supreme, right? We think there are two very eff effective methods. Basically, given how the two main branches of morality would be deontology and utilitarianism, as long as our extension shows to you how effective altruism does not meet either of these yardsticks, we win. So in, in terms of deontology, right, in terms of principle, we think if your intent is to help, sure, that's good. But yet you withhold resources, right? You preserve yourself, and there's no practical situation to guarantee, to actually co corroborate your intent of helping in the first place. We think that is already principally inconsistent, but more importantly, you forego your duty, for example, to your family, your other civil obligations. You technically don't have to vote because you may think that, oh, voting takes away your time, and therefore, you think that's not effective, and so you don't perform your civil duty. So principally consistent with the ontological morality in the first place. But more importantly, in terms of utilitarianism, right? We think all the practical harms that Kali already proves to in terms of how this encourages a toxic brand of charity and a toxic method of perpetuating goodwill already shows to you that individuals should not be allowed to or should not be like encouraged in terms of practicing effective altruism. Who are you to judge, right? Why do you think you have the best use of resources, right? We think the fact that they can easily back it also shows how effective this is. So let's go to CEO's extension. CEO's extension was basically how we promote a brand of charity that is not practical, that only, for example, um, that, that only contains structural, uh, they promote a the brand of charity that contains structural solutions, right? We think on our side, we at least give you more fluid and flexible methods to perform charity and achieve goodwill, right? Because we think morality is also a constantly evolving so, uh, social construct. What's socially acceptable and what's deemed to be socially acceptable also changes, which means that we don't offer a static solution. Your solution, however, is static, especially because there might be mismanagement of your own money, right? There might be misjudgments on the, counter, on the part of the individual. Let's see how you need efficacy, especially when you don't guarantee when you don't guarantee qualifications and knowledge of that individual. We think on the comparative, we definitely win. We think there are, there are other cases are, are entirely derivative of OO. Let's go to OO, right? We think what they gave us was first, in terms of principle justification, that situations can never be static. I just rebutted that, but also for three layers of analysis. Firstly, we think that when you throw money at it, it's not only a static solution as you hope to avoid, it also completely disregards where that money actually goes to in terms of the end cause, right? Secondly, we think morality, as, already, as I told you, is constantly changing, which means that what's publicly urgent or what's like 
most deserving of aid also constantly changes. We think that's a problem solution mismatch. But also thirdly, note that liquid cash does not necessarily translate into the best outcomes. We think mismanagement, both on the part of these corrupt NGOs that OCO precisely pointed out, already shows how this like earning to give method obviously fails and falls on the tech. But more importantly, when they said that it's sustainable because it allows self-preservation, three levels of rebuttal. A, in your world, everyone has been able to pursue self-preservation and regular altruism, right? But B, there's also no guarantee that self-preservation doesn't translate, as Kylie said, into perverse self-oriented incentives, which is obviously much more likely because we think it's intuitive that humans are relatively self-interested. But most importantly, thirdly, you actively encourage individuals to pursue that route. So you crowd out regular altruism, you dismiss it as a legitimate principle and approach to morality. We think that also fundamentally compromises your entire purpose of doing good in the first place. So when they say that it's dumb to put people in a position where they have the propensity to turn it around. We think precisely, right? Compared to regular altruism, you obviously allow much more room for backing out. Because once you're at that level of social and like, economic affluence, obviously you don't have that much incentive to actually do good. With the comparison is this. On offense side, you corrupt the concept of morality, right? Charity loses its purpose and by forcing this like constant recalculation and quantifying of the intrinsic value of social causes you dismiss these fail to create positive outcomes because of the lack of insider knowledge and professional expertise of these so directly for morally legitimate causes of which the natural corollary is you become principally inconsistent in trying to do good in the first space we think we combinations. We don't create a toxic culture where you cheapen causes. That is precisely the extension why we also rank above OG, right? Because we think only in closing government do we actually explain the principle and the practical implications of modern morality is only achieved when we regret effective altruism, right? We think OG did not really provide the framework, nor did they really explain exactly why the principle should be should be like this. We think the obligations are only mechanized and Kylie's in my speech. We think that's precisely why we're very proud to be CG, very proud to propose. Thank you. All right, we thank God for the speech. We invite all the to sign up to the video. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yep, perfectly. Okay. okay. We think it's sad that both government benches, how government benches responses to the bulk of what we told you from CO was simply that individuals consolidate wealth and that when you earn for the intention to be greedy, that is problematic. This quote, or the world that government operates in, the point in which you earn money for the very basis of yourself, but effective altruism is a direct narrative that contradicts this because the sole reason you pursue extra wealth is for the cause to give the most good in society. That is the narrative in which we further, we don't understand why there's a consolidation of wealth. And even if that is true, even if you understand or you want to take their context, then they can't derive any benefits too. If it's true that individuals are so inherently selfish that they are unwilling to earn money to donate it, but they're going to earn the money to pull it up, to become the richest individual in society. What are the benefits government is trying to accrue to if individuals are so self-interested in this world? You cannot operate to tell us that effective altruism is just a facade people lie about. We think in society, you can't lie about effective altruism. The examples OG told you about H&M having sweatshops is not effective altruism when the money doesn't go anywhere. And number two, your effective altruism is directly neutralized. The point in which you actively do harm to other people as well by exploiting them, by making them work in horrible living conditions. They can't say that they were brand this under effective altruism when number one, you exploit people and number two, the money isn't even channeled to the most effective causes or to provide societal good. OG cannot run with this rhetoric to tell you it's a facade. We think closing government was rather derivative but they, we think they had some material to tell you why we shouldn't judge the intentions of individuals and where they donate. Now, we'll tell you why before I move on there, why we're explicitly different from opening opposition. Now, immediately tell you why that is. We told you the bulk of what we heard from opening opposition was to tell you that we need to prioritize the long term. We tell you, number one, I will tell you the roadmap as to how we get that long term change because we think that they told you the impacts of just the implications of being long term, but they didn't tell you how it works and will directly engage in the best cases of government ventures. But our explicit contribution to you was how we change the calculus of individuals, the point in which they maximize their utility to others. Notice that the metric of shaming individuals 
we're not donating enough is the reality of side of government because effective altruism simply means based on your current conditions based on your capacity to do better so if you're smart whether you can get a better paying job what then should my cause of action be so if you're an individual that is inherently unable to cope academically and i can't become the billionaire philanthropist then my effective cause of action will be to help people and to donate to that charity or to work in that soup kitchen. If I'm a poor individual and the one dollar that I donate will be ineffective in changing anything, this means I will go and volunteer at a soup kitchen, which change the calculus of individuals into evaluating their actions and to how it produces good societal right. outcomes. Side of government is the one with um, rogue charities, charities that don't work, the point in which they're able to shift their moral responsibility, the point in which they give a dollar and call it a day before I'm unsure. Even in Ops best case scenario of some solvency, the pathway to a high paying job creates immoral actions. You amass for the expense of starving children, corporal exploitation of the environment and workers. How is morally justified? Wouldn't you end up creating more, more moral hazards than you try to solve? Okay, this is where we're going to provide you the nuance of what they told you in OO and which will directly respond to the POI previously. They tell us that, oh, you're going to prioritize long-term goals and therefore you're going to lose lives on the net. You're not going to donate to the people currently starving. We then question them, is this an effective mechanism to do so? If me prioritizing my wealth now in order to earn more means that more net lives are lost because of me, that is not an effective cause of action. We tell you the policy or the way in which this narrative functions in the subconscious of individuals is to tell you it's a balancing act. It means that in order for me to be effective in the future, I need the individuals in Africa that are starving to not die by the time I'm a rich philanthropist. We think that means donating some sort of your wealth now to prevent them from utter damnation. But we tell you that doesn't mean donating all your wealth now and not being able to get the best cause of action. We've heard no refutation as to the best case in our They only wanted to engage with the worst possible outcome from CEO, which is that individuals will consolidate wealth. We told you in two responses. Number one, it's hard to do so because the point at which you consolidate wealth, effective altruism directly makes you justify or donate that wealth immediately because the whole point of earning more is to pay more to the charities, for example. The whole reason you get the doctor job or the highest paying job and become the billionaire in the first place is to give it back to oh. people. They can't tell you it's a consolidation of wealth. We tell you it's not, and even if they tell you that, oh, it's the action in and of itself that is immoral and wrong. We tell you the reason it happens in status quo is because look at how you as an individual want to pursue wealth. It is for your self-interested gains. You want to buy the best car, for example, or you want the latest iPhones. You want to be respected in society. Notice how the incentive structure changes on the side of closing opposition. And this is nuance that only came from outside explicitly. It's to tell you that now, when you earn more wealth, society's narrative and the perception you have going into that pathway to earn more wealth is toward the direct benefit of others. We think this is um, sufficiently able to negate the ability for you to become selfish in the first place. But even in the worst case scenario, which you don't think will happen, that you do consolidate some sort of wealth, we think there has to be a societal justification to the point which you hoard all of it. So maybe you might have a bigger house, but you're still going to donate most of that wealth to individuals. On their side, they don't have a narrative pushing people to do this. There is no set metric because on their side, you can simply donate a few dollars and call it a day because you don't evaluate whether or not my contributions of utility was effective or not. Whether the amount of money I have currently, and if I donated the, that amount, would it have created an effective utility? And if it did, was it to my to the extent in which I was able to give in the first place. We think there's immense amount of guilt that amounts on individuals. The point which is narrative is something that exists realistically in the society we live in. When individuals constantly tell you that rich people have an obligation to make most of their wealth because they have the most capacity to do so, we don't think it's simple to just negate all of that. We think there's immense amount of guilt that comes to individuals. And lastly, Dwight, we take over closing government why they can't take this. They told you we should respect individuals' decisions or to donate to the causes that they want to. Three, um, two, two pronged responses to this. Number one, even if we do respect that decision to donate anywhere, does that satisfaction and should that satisfaction trump the utility you get? So if I donate to that cause, but that cause is failing or there's no support for it, or this is money that it will inev inevitably help nobody, should I, my decision to be respected, then trump the lives of individuals? You could have said in Kenya that the lives 
digital safe in Africa. And number two, we think it's completely immoral to donate to causes or give money for the virtue of the I control it. So don't, donating to that YouTuber that you like so much and people respecting your decision, we think that in and of itself is an immoral act because you're actively prioritizing your self-pleasure and gain by donating, number one, but number two, by donating to causes that don't need it in the first place. And lastly, on charities that are unpopular, we think that means on our side that if it's true that a lot of people amass wealth to one charity, that means me giving money there is ineffective. I will go to other branches of charities. I will go to other causes. The other side is the one with consolidation of money to singular charities. We look at the mechanization of whether it's effective or not. Proud to Thank all speakers for the debate. M, what do we do now? All right. Um, thank you, everyone, um, for that debate. Um, thank you, everyone on Facebook for tuning in to the finals. Now, um, I guess um, with that, the finals is done. Everyone can leave the Zoom call. What's going to happen is that the uh, everyone can leave except the judges. Um, we will put you in a breakout room for deliberation. The rest, the debaters, the um, observers, you may leave the Zoom call and the award ceremony will happen on Facebook Live, so you can check it out there. We will send the link to the participants' groups. Um, yeah, with that, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.